We've been going through this book for a long time, and now we're finally at the last chapter of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 24. And it's interesting because we've already seen King David's last words, kind of what he said on his deathbed to uh, those who would follow him to kind of pass on his wisdom. We've seen uh, his, his mighty men were also his, kind of his, his top generals were listed off and the, the things they had done. But now in this very last chapter, you see something very strange. It's kind of this, it's a random event that happened kind of in the middle of David's life. And it's kind of stuck, it's kind of tagged on at the very end of the last chapter of 2 Samuel, the, these two books all about the life of King David. So it's kind of interesting. What is this all about? Why is this story, this historical event stuck here? And I think we're going to find out. I think you'll see at the end just how powerfully it wraps everything together in, the, in his entire life. So King David has done so many great things from defeating Goliath to conquering enemy nations like the Philistines, to building up the nation economically and in, in, in its military. He had made his choices in the fear and the wisdom of God, trembling before the Lord and carefully ordering his life. He'd also made mistakes. He'd made honest mistakes, even terrible mistakes, but had repented and asked for God's forgiveness. And he had given himself into the hands of God Almighty in the end. And that's the thing about a man of God. He will make mistakes. And you as Christians will make mistakes, believe me. You will make mistakes. But the difference is what you do after you make a mistake. Will you ask God's forgiveness or will you go your own way? Because the Father's arms are open in that situation. And we want to say, do I want to run away because I'm afraid of what, what Daddy's going to say, what Father God's going to say, or am I going to run toward him. Kind of reminds you of a teen who is at a party and they know I shouldn't be here. There's drinking here. And they think, okay, what do I do? Is it safe for me to call mom or call dad and say, can you come pick me up? And hopefully in that situation there, they trust mom and dad enough to say, I'm going to call home and have mom come pick me up. And mom will probably have some choice words for me in the car but I know it's fundamentally safe for me to do that. Similarly, I hope we feel toward God that we can run toward him and we can call him up in prayer, right? And say, God, I need your help in this situation. Hopefully we feel that God is a father who loves us in a way where we can trust him. Do you trust him today? Amen? Amen. Amen. We trust him. Okay. So we see in the last chapter... Here, this account of David calling a census of the nation to count all the young men of fighting age throughout all Israel. So he's going to initiate a census. Something similar is done in the United States. I recall when I reached a certain age, I had to register for a possible future military draft if it was necessary. I remember I had to go in and kind of fill out a card and mail it in to say, that would be me in the case of some terrible war where there was a draft. So David is kind of doing something similar. He is counting all the able-bodied fighting men in all of Israel. And God was displeased with Israel during this time in their history. They were not living rightly. They were doing injustice. They were persecuting the poor. They were mistreating widows and orphans. So this is a time when God was not happy with the direction Israel was going. So this had to do with Satan as well, the adversary, provoking this, this idea of a census in David's heart. And I assume it was pride. It was just a sense of pride. And that's, it actually says that in 1 Chronicles 21.1, Satan provoked the census. But it says in 2 Samuel 24 that God provoked David toward this decision as well. Okay, so you've got God and Satan working on, God, uh, working on David, doing something, guiding him in a direction. And you have to remember, during this time, Israel was off course, way off course. And I thought to myself, how does this make sense? How can it say that God uh, was encouraging him to do the census at the same time Satan was luring him to, to do the census? How does that work? 
And I thought to myself, have there been times in my life where I was going to make a dumb decision? And God saw that I was about to make a dumb decision, and he allowed me to make it, even encouraged me to make it to teach me a lesson, to say, oh, you want to do that stupid thing here? Okay, let me help you do that safely. And now you can learn from what you did. <laughs> Parents in here. But many times as the kids are younger, you protect them from themselves. But at some point, I'm sure many of you come to the point where you have to say, well, fine, go, go, go to that party. Fine, let's see, see what happens then. And then when they come home and they're, they're upset and they're hurt, and you say, well, didn't I tell you that? <laughs> didn't I tell you that it was going to happen like that? So... God as a father, I think, works that way too, where he will allow us to make a, a dumb choice. He even almost protect us as we're making it so we don't get too hurt too badly and then let us learn something from it. So that's what it kind of made me think of here. Um, I think there's something similar going on here. David and Israel are doing bad things. Satan is provoking it. David is allowing it. So God says, all right, fine, do it. Let's see how it goes for you. It says this in 2 Samuel 24. Again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the army commander, he said, Go throughout the tribes of Israel and enroll the fighting men, so I may know how many there are. But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of, the, of my Lord see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do such a thing? So Joab, I think, he can sense this is from pride. This is, not a, this is not a godly thing to be doing. The king's word, however, overruled Joab and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. So Joab advises David, how about you not do that? You ever had a friend who was like, you come to him with your brilliant idea, and you're like, listen, here's what I'm going to do. It's going to be great. And your friend's like, that's a really dumb idea. You should not do that. And you're all like, oh yeah, what do you know? Why should I listen to you, you know? <laughs> or maybe listen to him and say, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. I need to put it that way. <laughs> In any case, David overrules him. He says, no, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to do this anyway. The census ends up taking nine months and 20 days. And then they return and it says this. After crossing the Jordan, they camped near Aor, south of the town in the gorge. And then we went through Gad and on to Jazer. They went to Gilead and the region of Tamoth, Hachi, Dan John, all around towards Sidon. They went everywhere. They went toward the fortress at Tyre, all the towns. Finally, they went on to Beersheba and the Negev of Judah. After they had gone through the entire land, they came back to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. So they go everywhere with their pen and their pencil, IRS, doing their audit, doing their census bureau, you know, census.gov, and they're getting all the data. But this is not a good thing that's happening right now. So Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 able-bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. If you remember, the, the, the kingdom was kind of splitting between Israel in the north and Judah in the south. It was kind of splitting so we get an, an account by each grouping. And what we see here is 1.3 million fighting men are available in both Israel and Judah. 1.3 million, that's a lot. I think, I think right now the United States, though, has a standing army of like 8 million, maybe? Maybe more. I think 8 million might be France, actually. I think the United States has more than that. I could be wrong. I'd have to check the numbers. In any case, it's a large amount, 1.3 million. It was interesting, though, that I, I thought to myself, when I attempt to, to take a bad course of action, oftentimes in my life, God will prevent it. Oftentimes, God will almost block me and not let me do it. Okay? When I was a single guy, believe me, there were many times where I was chasing after a girl that I liked. And God said, nope, that she's not the right one. And he would block me. He said, nope, that she's not the right one for you. That's not the one I have for you. I've got someone better for you whom I've called you to be with. 
So God often blocks us for our own good. Even someone like a friend who might backstab us later. He almost blocked us in that situation. Like, no, don't be friends with that person. So don't be friends with that person. Many other situations, maybe it's a job that's going to be a curse to you. God will block you from that situation where he'll protect you from it. Can anyone relate where it just doesn't quite work out? Many times that's happened, even here in Owasso. But then there are times when God will allow it, even move it forward, and it seems to be for the purpose of teaching me not to sin in the future. God will almost allow me to make a mistake so that I can see how bad the results are going to be. And I remember the last time that happened, and it was very painful. A very painful mistake that I made. And it haunts me to this day. But it stands there as a reminder, Justin, don't forget about that. And also, like I said today, on November 1st, I celebrated 11 years sober, right? But just as long I was an alcoholic active in my cups. But guess what? That, that's, oddly enough, it's a blessing because I can look back on those 11 years of nightmare before I got sober and say, thank God I'm not there anymore. And it's a good, it's a good wall in front, of, in front of the alcohol when it might tempt me in the future. I can say, I remember what it was like in jail. I remember what it was like on probation. I remember what it was like to be hung over every day. I remember what it was like. And I never want to go back there again. Thank you, Jesus. It's a reminder. God will sometimes allow us to make a mistake, so it'll stand as a reminder in our memories forever. Don't go down that road again. And that's a good thing. I, I like that. I mean, I don't like it at the time when I'm making the mistake. But in general, it's a good thing. It's a good reminder for me always. So David does this census, and it says in verse 10, David was conscious stricken after he had counted the fighting men. He said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, Lord. Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. He realizes what he's done is wrong. And here we find our first point for today. When we sin, our conscience will be stricken. We will feel as if something is wrong. I don't know if you've ever done something bad, stolen something, mistreated someone, and you realized immediately, oh, I did something bad. And you feel convicted about it. You feel, oh, this is, that was not right. I think every human in this room can relate to that feeling. I know I can. That's a feeling of guilty. And the world will often try to wash it away while you're just oppressed, while you're just, you just need some mental health therapy. Oh, you just, you just need a pill. That's, that's not something that needs to be washed away. It's something that needs to be forgiven. Yeah, so it's something that needs to be forgiven. Medication is also helpful, of course, too. I don't, I'm not ragging on medication. Medications are good. Counseling is good. So this is our first point today. When we are conscious stricken, we can seek forgiveness. And that's, just, that's not just true for Christians. Even a person of the world will feel guilty when they steal or guilty when they cheat. We all have a moral law written in our minds which tells us there is right and wrong, good and evil. David immediately prays and asks for God's forgiveness. We too should immediately bring our sins to God and pray and ask for God's forgiveness. If we've harmed someone else, we should go to them and ask for their forgiveness as well. If we've caused material harm, we should make amends. So if we hurt someone's feelings, what do we naturally do? We come to them and we say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. You're my friend. I care about you. Please forgive me. Nine times out of ten, they, they normally will forgive you. Also, though, I think it's a good thing if we've, we've caused some damage. We can make amends in a way where... Maybe we broke their lawnmower. I don't know. You know. We, we, we can say, you know what, I'm going to help you get a new one, or I'm going to help get that one fixed. I'm going to make amends for what I've done. Makes sense, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So in this situation, David is trying to figure out, how can I make this right after I've done this wrong? 
But remember, this wasn't just about David. David was in the wrong, but so was Israel. Israel had been doing bad things. It doesn't say exactly where they'd gone wrong, but they'd been doing some very bad things. So let's see what happens next on verses 11 through 15. Before David got up the next morning, the word of the Lord had come to this guy, his Gad the prophet. David's here and he says, go tell David, this is what the Lord says. I'm giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, shall there come on you three years of famine or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you or three days of plague in your land? Now then think it over and decide how I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated, and 70,000 of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. So we see judgment coming on the people of Israel because of what they've done. And many die in a great plague upon the land. It's a disaster for the nation. Many die, but they have been by their actions disobedient to God harming one another, and God is correcting the nation. Second point today, God's judgment is real. He judges peoples, he judges nations, and he will deliver swift justice. We should remember that God is a just judge and put sin to death in our own lives. Otherwise, there will be consequences. Either we kill sin by the Holy Spirit, or sin begins to drive us away from God. I don't know if you can relate to that. Okay, next in verses 16 and 17. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented concerning the disaster and said to the angel, who was afflicting the people enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. Point number three today, David takes responsibility for his position as a leader. He takes responsibility for his family. He takes responsibility for himself. We should do the same. Let's not play the victim. Let's not pretend we're oppressed. We need to take responsibility before God for what we've done. And God will forgive us. That's the thing. Take responsibility for what you've done. But then bring it to God and say, I need you to forgive it because I, I can't fix it. And then Jesus forgives our sins and he makes our slate clean. But the first step is to admit that I've done wrong myself and not hide it anymore. So I like to put it under a rug so no one sees it. But instead, sh 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 show it to God. We, we have think, well, if we show it to God, he's going he's gonna, to you know, punch us or something. No, he's going to forgive us if we ask. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Please forgive me, and he forgives us. And he makes us new. During this time in history in the Old Testament, there was no Jesus yet. Okay, that's why you see these judgments, right? Because Jesus had not come to be the Savior yet. But even, I mean, there's still judgments in the book of Revelation, so it's not like he, he's given up the, the seat of judge. God still is a judge, but he loves us. Okay? He's looking for a way to get us off the hook. He says, come to my son, Jesus Christ, and I will let you off the hook. And not only that, I'll adopt you into my family as my very own children. That's the kind of God we serve. So check this connection out here, though. The threshing floor of Eruna the Jebusite. That's super important, okay? You're going to see something here that connects the entire Old Testament it's really interesting. I did not realize it until I just had finished writing this. I was like, whoa. So this, so God gives instructions to David. He says, go to the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite on Moriah, Mount Moriah. So David goes, and Aruna says, why is my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague and the people may be stopped. So he's going to build an altar at the threshing floor. And that brings us to our fourth point today, friends. In this crisis where David doesn't know what to do, when he's made a mistake and the nation is suffering for it, when all else fails, it's time to worship God. 
when you're struggling, when you're messed up, when you don't know what to do, put on that worship playlist on YouTube and just start singing out worship to God. I do that sometimes. I have my own worship playlist with lyric songs on YouTube. And I'll just play that and I'll start singing along right at home by myself. And the neighbor is probably hearing that thinking, what is he doing? And I don't care. Listen, I'm about to sing out to the Lord. Come on. Sometimes you got to worship. And you know who I learned that from? My fiance, Chelsea. She's the one who says, you know what? When I'm completely down and disturbed and struggling and upset, she worships. And that's just, that's the opposite of what you think you would do in that situation. But that's what she does. She worships, praises God in the storm. And that changes the game then. Worship God in the storm. So next we see David purchase this place from Aruna. It says in verses 22 to 24, Aruna said to David, let my lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering and here are threshing sledges and ox yokes. Your majesty Aruna gives all this to the king. Aruna also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Aruna, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Point number five today. Following Jesus costs something. It isn't free. There will be a cost. It will cost time. It will cost service. It will cost money, giving tithes and offerings. It will cost you pain and struggle. It will cost you friendships, people that you love who don't understand why you follow Jesus. It will divide your family at times. There will be a cost, and David understands that. Aruna wants to give him the property, and David says, no, I will pay for it with my own money. I, I can't take it. So we, and that's why we give back here. And we give, we give back to God. Service and time and worship and praises and prayer requests and testimonies and tithes and offerings and prayers and sermons. We give back to God because he's been so good to us. Lastly, in verses 24 and 25, so David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. Point number six, obey God carefully. David is careful to listen to the prophet who gives him a word from God and then he does what the prophet tells him. He, he obeys God's instructions. He went to Aruna's threshing floor. What if David had gone to the wrong threshing floor and thought, well, this one will do. No, it's not. It needs to be this one. <laughs> what if he'd gone to the threshing floor but not purchased it? So, well, I'll just rent it. <laughs> Again, it's not quite going to work. Believe me, there's been times in my life where God will tell me to do something and I don't understand why. You know, he'll tell me to go someplace and be somewhere, and I'm like, why? Why do you want me to be there right then? And I find out after, not before, <laughs> you know. I remember one time, he, he wanted me in this one place at this one time and to place this book in this one spot, and then, sure enough, literally there was a guy walking from the other direction as I was moving toward, and I set the book down, and then he came over like five minutes later and grabbed the book. It was like a Bible, I think. So but what if my timing had been off? You gotta obey the Lord carefully. Okay? But he's he's doing things, you know? And sometimes it's just something as simple as Justin, put on your jacket before you leave the house. And I and I was like, well, it's not that cold out, but it's shine, some sun shining. And as soon as I get outside, I'm like, oh, it is pretty cold. <laughs> I should have just listened to God. Okay. Crazy. God knows though. He just he, he's God's thinking seven steps ahead of me, you know, in the next day. And I'm thinking, I'm at step one, like, why? Okay, lastly, point number seven. We want to understand why. Why is this the last chapter of David's life? This is, this is a thing where he messed up. <laughs> this is something where he messed up. He's, he's really interesting. Why is he talking about this? Listen, this shows King David was just a sinner who struggled with pride, and God helped him anyway. And he would turn to God, and God would forgive him. And I think it's, it's communicating to all of us that we can make mistakes, and God's going to love us through them, and help us to learn from them. 
And it's a perfect reminder, I think. But about the threshing floor of Aruna, David built an altar at the exact same place that hundreds of years earlier, my friends, this is the spot where Abraham came and built an altar and God told him, sacrifice your one and only son, Isaac. It was on Mount Moriah. That's where he was. Same spot, hundreds of years later. Abraham offering up Isaac. And what does God say? Stop. I'm, I myself will provide a sacrifice. And years later, years later, this is the spot, and it says in 2 Chronicles 3.1, Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite, the place provided by David. This spot here is where Solomon's temple would be built. It is the spot, I believe, where one day, when Jesus Christ returns to the earth, he will rule and reign from that spot on Mount Moriah, from the, from the temple, right here, where David set up the altar on Mount Moriah, on the threshing floor of Arun, the Jebusite. Same spot that Abraham brought Isaac up, and God had said, I want you to sacrifice your only son. And Abraham's about to do it. And God says, stop. I myself will provide a sacrifice. And here's the thing, friends. Put it together now. Abraham offering up Isaac. He stops him. What does God do? He, he offers up his only son, Jesus Christ. And for Jesus Christ, the blade did not stop. But it came down. And Jesus became that perfect sacrifice. Here's my theory then. I believe the spot where Jesus was crucified was at the threshing floor of Arun and the Jebusite. That his blood then was poured out there at the exact same spot. That's my theory anyway. It may not be true. But it all fits together. It's one big story. The blood of Jesus makes us clean. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, God, that you are, you are writing our stories and it all fits together. Help us to be like David, like Abraham, like the disciples around Jesus who saw your plan come together perfectly in our lives. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.